we go through things. Good things, bad things. Great times, sad times. Ups, downs. And one thing I think many of you, like me, have come to understand that, that as these things, good, bad, up, down, great, sad, as these things go on, that oftentimes they are the results of choices that we have individually made. It's a good choice and or a bad choice. Then creates these complications. And I think it's important in life that we own our choices. Could I hear a good amen today? That it's not always someone else's fault. That oftentimes it's nobody's but our own good and bad. But then we also know that, that, the, that these things that go on are also at times the result of the choices of others. It's not something we did, but because our lives are connected to them, their choice impacts our life, good and bad. And then we realize sometimes that these things go on in life as a combination of the two. It's my choice and their choice. And those choices collide and it creates good, bad, up, down, great, sad. Creates it. And then we also realize that there are things that go on in our lives that are not the result of choices that we have made or anyone else has made, but they are, as the Bible said, God calls us the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. And honestly, there's a certain amount of God's blessing that just hits your life because you're on the planet. You know, you're just here. It's like you're walking through the rain, right? Rain hits you. I think many of us, if we were to get very, very introspective and even look back at our lives before we became Christians, would have to say, wow, God took care of me there. How many of you have to say that, right? Or, wow, there was a certain amount of God's blessing on that part of my life. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. But then we also understand that sometimes things happen in our lives because there is a thief in the earth who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And sometimes things happen in our lives because of a direct satanic attack against our lives. And so we, we understand that. But the thing about life is, is that as we live, we sometimes lose someone or something from our lives. And what we learned, all of us, is that we don't get to call time out. I'm sure all of us would love for a pause button where when something happens, you could hit pause and kind of catch your breath, get ready, and then hit play, and Monday would come. But Monday's coming. 2016 is looking at us. So we don't get to hit pause button. We don't have a reset button. We have to keep going forward in life. And there are many of us in this room and many people that you may know that have just gotten up and you just keep going because you have really no other choice. And yet you live your life with a sense of loss and regret. It's like there's a void on the inside of you, and yet you keep going. You're going to show up on Monday. And yet, there is that, like a hole or a sense of loss inside of you. Several, several years ago, Rochelle and I and our entire church at the time went through what I've called for quite a while six years of loss. I'll give it to you very briefly and tell you what happened so you kind of get a sense of it. But we had, we had it was our 10th anniversary year, so this is quite a while ago. This year's 38, but so it was quite a few years ago. But it was our 10th anniversary year, and for 10 years in, in our church, we had never had less than 25% growth every year in our church, 20, 10 years in a row. That's, that's remarkable for any quote-unquote business or enterprise, 10 years in a row. 
we had just moved into our old sanctuary next door that's now children's and nursery. Of course, none of this was here. We just moved, we'd been in there for a while, for a couple of years, actually about six years, no, about four years. And we'd grown to a regular Sunday morning attendance of about 1,900 people on Sunday morning. And we finished the year and fully expected another 10 years of 25% growth a year. And then something happened in our country. Two televangelists who I did not know, had nothing to do with, did not, had never met them. They had never spoken in our church. We were not a part of their particular denomination. But both of them, within about a three-month period, were found to have committed moral failure in their life. Quite honestly, they both had affairs. All right? And they were caught. And I never dreamed that their actions would affect us. Let me say it again. They had never spoken in our church. I did not know them. We were not a part of their denomination. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't even like either one of them. They didn't float my boat, okay? They did other people, but they did me, okay? And so I never dreamed it. But there began. The first one was found in January. The next one was found in March. And in that January of that year, the moment it came out, I don't, it was like somebody flipped a switch and for the next three years, our church was never back in what they call in accounting terms in the black. Every month we were in the red. Now, we've never had one month in the red. In the red means we didn't, we didn't meet budget every month. And we went three years without meeting budget. And not to the tune of a couple hundred bucks, thousands of dollars a month. By the time that three-year period was over, half a million dollars in savings was gone, money that we had saved to pay a balloon note on the property across the street where many of you parked today. And we still owe, we had a million-dollar balloon note. We still owed the money, the million dollars, and the half a million dollars we had saved was gone, right? Uh, Rochelle and I had not been paid, and I don't know how long. Other staff members hadn't been paid. We had to lay a lot of people off. And I actually thought that we were going to have to close the church and file bankruptcy because I saw no relief, no change. Nothing I did, nothing we did seemed to work, and more people just kept leaving. We went from 1,900 down to 900 in church on Sunday. All right? And I, I actually hired an appraiser to come out and do what's called a fire sale appraisal to see if, if, if we had to file bankruptcy or when we filed it, would we be able to sell the property for enough to at least pay the note? And he said yes. And so basically, Rochelle and I and my kids, I'd already planned that we would leave El Paso. How could I stay here with that kind of failure hanging over me? That we would leave town and, and I thought we'd maybe move to Phoenix or Scottsdale and I would get a job selling real estate or, or selling cars or doing something. I, I, but I I would take care of my wife and my kids, and that's the way my life would be. And uh, the d dreams of doing something great for God had come to a crashing halt. And that's what I assumed. At the end of the three years, God spoke to me one day as I was coming around downtown on the freeway and told me something he needed me to do, a spiritual thing, and I began to do it. And it slowly began to turn, and then it took another three years to get back to that place we had been at six years before. Does that make sense to you? So I've told you all that story to tell you this. For several years after that, I would tell anybody and everybody that I felt like I had lost six years of my life. Now let me show you something about loss. All right, on the night that we moved into this building, the night we moved in here and we dedicated this incredible sanctuary, a lot of you were here, all right, if you weren't here, it was one of the real magnificent nights in the life of our church. We had two dedication services that night. Tommy Barnett came in, did them both. It was freezing cold. We opened, the, we dedicated the building on December the 31st. We had a huge fireworks display. It's the first time uh, we'd done that. It was really something. And now we do it, of course, every New Year's Eve. And uh, it was a great time. And, it, and many, many, many of my friends from across America and even around the world came in for the dedication. And, and, uh, I was standing in the first service. You cannot imagine how many people were here. How many of you remember that, right? I mean, you cannot imagine how many people were here. I mean, we, there were people everywhere, right? Uh, uh, one of our security men at the time worked for the fire department. And he told me, I don't want to know how many people are here. <laughs> I, all I know is that there's 3,600 people here. Well, there was way more than 3,600. I mean, they were out in the lobbies. They were everywhere, people everywhere. 
And then we did the same thing in the second service. But in the beginning of the first service, I came in that door right there, and I was surrounded with my friends. And my friends were all smiling and happy, and I was standing there, and, and they looked at me, and they said, Wow, Pastor, this is, this is amazing. And you know what? In that moment of great victory and great rejoicing, this is what loss can do to you. I stood there, and I said, I should have been here six years before. So that sense of loss can rob you of your joy and your happiness. And it just keeps going with you, doesn't it? And it just keeps robbing you. And I felt that way for a long time. And to be quite honest with you, I used that, six, that, that belief that I'd, been, that I'd lost six years of my life as a, as a motivational tool. And I became obsessed. To be quite honest with you, I did not take a vacation for over 30 years. Because I was determined to somehow try to get that six, that six years back. Well, a few years ago, I was telling that story at a pastor's conference out of town. And I shared with them what we went through and what I felt God had shared with me to do. And it began to turn it. and It turned it. And finally, we got out of it. And thank God we'd never been back. And... Uh, When I was done that night, the driver, I got in the car with my driver and he was taking me to my hotel and the Lord spoke to me in my car. And I quote, I went to my hotel room and I wrote it down and this is what he said. Why have you accepted this? Listen to these next words. Why are you thinking Believing and speaking this way. This way being that I had lost six years of my life. Now why that got my attention is that many of you know Proverbs 23, 6 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We also know that believing and speaking is what faith is, right? We believe and therefore we speak. And I know that Jesus said continually that ultimately in my life and your life, it's going to be true to us according to what we believe, according to what we speak, according to our faith. So he said, why are you thinking, believing, and speaking this way? He continued. He said, if you will believe me, I will restore those years and the fruit that was eaten away. And instead of living your life, with a sense of regret, you will live your life with a sense of satisfaction. Now, to be honest with you, at that moment in my life, I'd never heard anybody use the word restore in reference to our relationship with God. And sad to say, it's still not being spoken of much in the body of Christ. In fact, among guys that I listen to and pay attention to, <clears throat> I think... Joseph Prince and I are the only two guys that really talk a lot about it. And it's a shame because it belongs to you. Now, it's one thing for, for me to come in to tell you God told me this, but it's another thing, listen to me now, anything you think God tells you, you got to find scripture to back it up. Because if you don't find scripture, then that was that pizza you ate at 11 o'clock, all right? And I don't, care, I don't care how many goosebumps you got or how glorious it was or how warm, fuzzy feeling you have on the inside. If you can't back it up with Scripture, you need to get rid of it. That's right. Amen. Because the Bible says that Satan can even transform himself into an angel of light and deceive the very elect. So God gave us his word to back it all up. Can I get a good amen on that? Amen. I've had people come up to me over the years and say, Pastor, the Lord told me this. And I'm like, no, he didn't. The Lord didn't tell you that. Oh, you're just trying to rob me of my faith. No, I'm trying to keep you from getting shipwrecked. Because <laughs> what you're saying God told you does not line up with Scripture. All right? So I had to find Scripture. So the word restore was the word that jumped out at me. So you ready? I'm going to take you on a journey. It's going to take us a few weeks to do it. But let's go. Acts, the third chapter. Oh, my God. I can hardly wait to start sharing this with you. You know, I, 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 I compare my teachings to a meal. Today, you're going to get the chips and the salsa. That's pretty good. In El Paso, man, we got we we figured out chips and salsa. 
Can I get an amen and a testimony? All right, Acts, the third chapter. Okay, uh, let me set the stage for you. Peter is uh, preaching on the day of Pentecost. He actually begins in the second chapter, and he's going all the way through, and he's laying out the case for faith in Jesus Christ. And he's telling a little bit of his beginning and his life and what he was about and why he was the Messiah. And he's preaching to a bunch of Jewish people on the day of Pentecost and he's going to give an altar call and 3,000 men plus women and children are going to get saved on the first day of the church. What a great way to begin. All right? So he's speaking. So we're going to jump into the middle of it, all right, for the sake of time. Beginning in verse 19, Peter writes and he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm going to try to remember to explain that to you, what the times of refreshing means. But let me tell you, they're already here. Amen. All right? It's not something we're waiting for. They have already come. Okay? But he continues. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive. Stop there for a moment. Now, it's important here what he's talking about. He's already laid out that Jesus has already come and left. And now he's talking about the second coming, right? So he's talking about the period of time between when he ascended to heaven the first time and when he comes back the second time, which just so happens to be the time period in which all of us are living our lives. Amen. We're living our lives in that gap. Okay, and so the first time he came and the second time, and right now, heaven has received him. Did you see that? Heaven has received him. Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. All right, so heaven has received him. Okay, and so now he's talking about something that's going to take place in between those two comings. Now back up to, with me to verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things until the times of the restoration of all things. All right? The restoration of all things. Okay? One translation says, until everything that was lost shall be restored. The literal Greek text says, everything that can be restored shall be, then he shall return. So there is a promise to each of us living now in the New Testament church that God wants to restore everything in your life that can be restored. God wants to bring restoration to your life. It is a New Testament promise. It belongs to you and to me. It was spoken to the New Testament church and it is something that each of you should start believing for in your life. That your God is going to bring restoration to your life. That everything that can be restored will be. That he wants to bring this into your life. All right? Now, he wants to restore everything that was lost. You know, when I think of that, I, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, there's a verse of scripture in the Old Testament speaking to the New Testament where God said that there will be days as heaven on earth. You know, every time I think about that verse, I, don't, I, can't, I can't really explain that to you because I've never been to heaven. But it's not important that I understand what God meant. What's important is that he understands what he meant and that I simply believe for it to happen in my life and in your life. Amen. That we will have days of heaven heaven on earth where everything that can be restored is restored now why would God want to bring restoration to your life and my life I think one reason is is because as you know children are oftentimes a reflection of their parents and you are a child of God You are a child of God. And I believe that God shines his light through us. Matthew, the fifth chapter. So let your light shine before men that they may see the good works of God in your life and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
I believe that God wants to bring, one reason why God wants to bring restoration to your life is not only to heal that void, that hurt, that pain in your life, but also so that the people that you are around will see God's restoration in your life and go, wow, that had to be God. And give God glory for it. Amen? How many of you, how many of you can see that, right? So let us embrace this possibility. Let us embrace this truth. Now, I say let us embrace it, and I say it to a couple of you in here because there are some of you in here today that your house, you know, in Matthew 7, Jesus compared our lives to a house. And in a house, there's different rooms. And some of you have a room in your house that you don't go in. You keep it under lock and key. Because in that room, there is so much hurt that you just don't go in there. And you don't let anybody go in there. I wish it helped, but I'm going to say, I hope it helps some, that I am sorry that some of you sadly encountered when you were children evil humans. I'm sorry for that. You shouldn't have, but you did. Through no fault of your own, you encountered them. Some of you did not have good parents. I'm sorry. You should have. It wasn't your fault. Some of you, in adult life, met not good people. Or just things happened to you. And now you've got a room in your house. And all I want to say to you today is to think about just going. I'm not going to ask you to open the door to the room. I'm just going to ask you to go stand outside the door. Just stand outside the door in your heart. Just go stand outside the door. And I believe, I'm praying that sometime today or next week, sometime when you're ready, you're going to realize that Jesus is standing there with you. And he wants to open that door. And he's not going to make you go into that room by yourself. In fact, he is ready to go into that room with you and get rid of that darkness and bring restoration to your life. You may have lost your innocence. You may have lost a loved one. You may have even lost a child. And you're going forward because you really have no choice. But God has come to you today to tell you that you're going to go forward, but that he can bring restoration to your life in ways that I can't explain and that you can't fathom. But he is big and he is grand and he is glorious and he is unlimited in what he can do in your life. Now, go with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus, the 22nd chapter. We spent a lot of time in Exodus, huh? The last few weeks looking at the life of Moses. And I want you to see something about restoration. Are you glad you came? Right? He wants to restore everything that was lost. Do you know that God can even restore your years? Nah, I could wave in the white flag. 
Exodus 22. This is under the law, and I want you to see something. Now, stop with me for just a second. Look back up here. In my life, when I heard the, re the word restoration, I already had a preconceived idea of restoration because I love to watch the shows on TV where they restore classic cars. <laughs> right? How many of you enjoy to watch those shows? I love them. I love them. I love watching them. And let me say to you today that if you have a classic car that is restored, particularly a 67 Corvette, God wants you to give it to me. <laughs> you, you don't have to pray about it. No, I've already prayed about it. I've already got the mind of the Lord on the matter. If you have a Porsche or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or an Aston Martin that you are not driving, God wants you to give it to me. I will be down front after the service. I'm serious. He wants me to have it because he knows I will drive the wheels off of that sucker and I will enjoy it and you're not doing anything but polishing it. Amen. So come see me after the service. Hallelujah. All right. You know, I have actually said that all over the world and every crowd reacts just like you. They all laugh, but I'm going to just keep on believing and speaking. Amen. You never know. <laughs> All right, so I'm saying all that to you to say that my idea of restoration was back to the original. But here's the fact about life. Is it, it's impossible sometimes to get the original back. You can't. The original was one of a kind. Hmm? So does that mean you can't get restoration? No, there is restoration for you. But in a definition that you need to expand and let God be bigger. Does that make sense to you? You know, I, I, I've got a friend of mine that was offered Microsoft Microsoft stock at $1 a share. That day will never come again. <laughs> and he missed it. Oh, if you want to watch depression come on a man, just bring up that. I'm telling you, man, his whole countenance just goes, because oh. he would be a wealthy man today. He was offered 10,000 shares at $10,000. Do the math. Yeah. So that's not coming again. But yet, you see, we, we think of restoration of the original. Well, sometimes the original can't come back. Sometimes it can. But there's still restoration to your life. Now, this is what I want you to see here. Look at Exodus 22, verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four ox sheep for a sheep. I want you to see that under the law, and here's what you need to see. Bang, first thing out of the shoot today. With God, restoration from God is always more than you lost. It is not one for one. It is more than you lost. Let me say it again. It is always more than you lost. Pastor, I lost this, this, this friendship. Okay, you may not be able to get that one back, but God will bring you another one that is better than the one you lost. It's always more. Come on. It's always more. So that's the first thing I want you to expand your heart to, that God's restoration in your life is going to be more than you lost. Not equal to, more. More than you lost. Even under the law, restoration was two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, even seven times more than you lost. And you have a better covenant with better promises than what they did under the law. Amen. All right? So, the other day, I was out in the community and a, a guy that I know came up to me and he just suffered a terrible loss in his life, a loss of a relationship. It was a terrible loss in his life. And I was talking to him and, and it was just a very difficult moment and we were talking and he had uh, searched me out 
and uh, found me. And so we were talking and I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, Charles, I'll, I will never be happy again. And I looked at him and I said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that up until last night, I'd never told anybody and not even my kids. But I felt like the Lord wanted me to share it with you this weekend. So if it'll help you, then I'm willing to share it. Last Christmas, uh, we had done all of the Christmas performances. Jared just told you about it. 58,000 people in eight days or seven days, whatever it is. I mean, that's, that's astounding, right? You know, I mean, I'm just saying this the way I think, right? I mean, that, that, that's more in one week than a lot of churches have in years. And on top of that, 5,000 confirmed people raised their hand and prayed and asked Jesus into their life. And we know from, from studies done on a national scale that for every person that raises their hand, there's another one that prays the prayer that doesn't raise their hand. So we could safely say 10,000, but we don't. We could confirm 5,000. People came into the kingdom of God through our Christmas show. And, you know, we finished up all the shows and the numbers were astounding and we were all just so happy. And when it was over, uh, me and my family, we have a little room back here in the back where we go between services and we, we brought in a meal and we ate Christmas Eve together and it was a spectacular time. And the next day, all of my family was coming over to my house and we were going to have a great day at Christmas. And so, you know, we just finished this spectacular week, all the attendants, all the people born again, have my kids, my, my grandkids around me. It's such a spectacular time. And yet, when I went home that night, I ended up on the floor of my bedroom and I literally cried until I had no more tears because I was so sad. This is what loss can do to you. That no matter how great other things are, you don't enjoy them because all you can feel is the loss. And I was laying on my floor in my, in my bedroom. As I said, I cried and literally till I had, there was no more tears. And I was laying there so alone, so depressed. And Jesus spoke to me. Just like this, he said, in this tone of voice, Charles kind of had a happy tone to his voice. Charles, did you know Rochelle is really happy? Praise God. And I lifted my head Thank you, Lord. and he said, no, she's really happy. Amen. Then he said, and we need you to be happy. Amen. Amen. Then he said, listen, then he said, we want you to be happy. Amen. You see, sometimes when you've lost someone or something, you think you have lost the right to be happy again. Well, God sent me here today to tell you that he's given you the right to be happy again. Amen. That you have that. And he wants you to be happy again. Those of you that have lost someone close to you, hey, let me tell you something. Right now, they're in heaven. And they're having a big time. A big time. Yeah. 
yeah, like throne room of God time, like seeing him, like talking to Peter, like meeting Moses, like walking around with Joseph, like having dinner with Jesus. They are having a big time. Let them be happy and you be happy. And those of you that may have lost children, the time you're away from them is nothing compared to the time you're going to be with them in eternity. You won't even remember this little vapor. Remember, Peter, Peter said that life on earth from God's view is a vapor. It's a vapor compared to eternity. So be happy. Open yourself up to being happy again. You have a right to be. Amen. Your loved one is happy. I hope that helped you. No matter what you lost, he can restore it to you as you learn to apply his promise of restoration. Turn with me quickly, oh my goodness, to Luke the fifth chapter. Let me show you this before I let you go. Are you glad you came today? Amen. Luke chapter 5. beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass, as the people passed, pressed upon him to hear the word of God, him, of course, being Jesus, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Matthew said they were also mending their nets, which means while they were fishing, their nets got damaged. So now they're having to fix them. Okay? And he entered in one of the ships, which was Simon's, that we know him later as Peter, and prayed that he would thrust him out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Do you get the mental picture? And when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a catch. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master or teacher, we have toiled all the night. Wow. All night. So he's got to be exhausted. He needs to be at home sleeping because he's got to go back out the next night. But he's having to spend extra time fixing his nets that were damaged. We have told all the night and have taken nothing. How about that? Right? You've worked all night. Your nets were damaged and you had nothing to show for it. We would say Peter's operating at a loss. So now he's got to finish this. He's got to go home. Try to get some sleep. He's got to come back, hope things are better that night, and explain to his wife how come they don't have money. Mama's not going to be happy. Because <laughs> they got needs, and in those days you live day to day. So that's Peter, right? It would have been so easy for him to say, hey, look, uh, you're, listen, uh, you're, you're a great teacher. Appreciate it. Glad the people enjoyed it. But I got real life going on here, so see you down the road. But he said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net, singular. Jesus told him to let down the nets, plural. He said, I will let down the net, singular. Here's a great Bible principle that I hope you'll get and understand today, right? Now, you know what's going to happen, right? How many of you have read, remember the rest of the story? Peter's going to go, he's going to let down the net, and he's going to get a net-breaking load of fish so big that his net breaks, and he's got to call his partners over, and it fills their boats and almost sinks their boats, what is interesting is I believe those were all the fish that Jesus wanted him to catch with his nets, plural. But even though Peter struggled because of his life experience and he acted on the word of God at a level that maybe we would look at and say, oh, Peter, I want you to see that Jesus did not change being who he is. So in your life, see all the fish that Jesus planned for Peter to catch, he kept at the boat. So Peter had lost, but Jesus brought restoration, but he brought more than Peter would ever imagine. Peter thought maybe, maybe, maybe he'd catch one net. Jesus had multiple nets full of fish there. Restoration from God is always more than you originally lost. And I want you to see that even though Peter struggled with letting down the nets, it didn't change Jesus from doing what he does and who he is. So even though you may be struggling with the thought of restoration, just go ahead and let God do bring restoration into your life. And he's going to just do it at the level he wants to do it. And you don't have to be perfect to get it all. You don't have to be perfect to get it all. Amen? You don't have to be perfect to get it all. 
It's awesome. Go with me back to Exodus 22, then we'll close. You got to see this part, and then I'll let you go. Exodus 22. Same chapter we were in. I want you to see a great truth here that, 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 that has been hidden for way too long. Look at verse 9. For all manner of trespass, whether it be a, an ox or a donkey or a sheep or raiment or any other manner of lost thing, which another challenges to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. All right? The first thing I want you to see here is that statement where, where it says it challenges to be his. In the literal Hebrew text, it says this. Then when he comes before the judges, he is to say, that is mine. That is mine. And what I wish is, is that they translated it correctly because every other place in the Bible where that word judges appears in the Hebrew, it's translated correctly. It should have been translated Elohim. Elohim is the name that we first see of God in Genesis 1. When God said, let us make man in our image, it said, and Elohim said, let us. It is the Trinity word, the Hebrew word for the Trinity. It is the plurality of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So what he says here was, is that when you come before God, you need to come before God and say, that is mine. Amen. That is mine. Say it with me. That is mine. Come on, say it like you mean it. That is mine. Say it one more time. That is mine. Restoration is mine. Say it with me. Restoration is mine. Amen? Amen. And, if, and, and don't make the mistake. If you believe God is punishing you, you'll never believe for restoration. God is not punishing you. All of his wrath was poured out on Jesus. What God wants to bring into your life is the restitution, the restoration of all things. Right? So say it with me again. That is mine. Amen. Stand to your feet with me, please.